So this morning, talking about the conflict of the kings, Psalm 2. It is the 4th of November, 2023. Our scripture focus will be Psalm 2. I'm introducing this as a new series of messages. We've concluded the last week with the inward groan, and now we're picking up a new set of teachings on the conflict of kings, which basically forms part of the inward groan. Now, this psalm, Psalm 2, is a prophetic psalm speaking of Jesus, the Messiah, the Lord's anointed son, but it infers the apostolic position of a triumphant end time church operating in the endowment of the Christ anointed. The psalm begins with the author, which is David, lamenting the world's present condition. Nearly 3,000 years ago, the psalm was written, penned down. But it speaks so much prophetically about uh, the conditions of the earth in which we find ourselves. So he's beginning to lament the conditions that he surveys within the world by saying the following verses 1 to 3. Why do the nations rage or conspire and the peoples plot the vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. I want us to look at that. So David is writing the psalm and he asks the following, Lord, why is it that everywhere I look in the world, the nations are in turmoil? Why are they, are they always devising some vain thing to the glory of man. Things like building the Tower of Babel, the Roman Empire, the World Economic Forum today, the United Nations, and every other system that is set against Christ. Why is it, Lord, that the presidents, the prime ministers, and everybody in high office, the kings of the earth, are always conspiring against you? and your anointed one, the Lord Jesus Christ and his church body. Why is it that the world's political leaders are always saying, let's put aside the limitations of God's word and cast away the laws and do what we plead? As you can see, nothing has changed in 3,000 years since the psalm was pinned down, as in the time of David. The nations of the world today are still in full revolt against the Lord and his anointing. And so it is that Psalm 2 is just as relevant as if it were written yesterday. So the psalm writer goes on and he pins down the following verses from verse 4. He says, he who sits in the heavens laugh. This is the rebuttal of God. This is the way that God responds to what the world and the leaders of the world is concocting. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill Zion. So we will talk in this series of messages defining the word Zion, what Zion means. And the king that is set on the hill of Zion, I will decree, declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son. In other words, show respect to the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled, kindled but a little, 
Blessed are all those who put <clears throat> their trust in God or Him. So all through the ages, we survey man's revolt against his maker. They built systems of revolt as far back as the Tower of Babel, through which men choose independence from God and rebelled against his authority. In verse 1, we see the following. They conspire, in other words, they're making secret plans jointly to commit evil and unlawful actions against God and his church. They rage, in other words, there's violent, uncontrollable anger against anything that has got Christ written over it. They plot, they scheme, they collide to overthrow anything that has got to do with the church. Now in this psalm we see four categories <clears throat> of those who set themselves against God. Four categories. <clears throat> and I want to bring your attention to these four categories quickly. These four categories are of those who set themselves against God. They hold to one opinion which has become their evil intent and their singular proclamation. They are the nations who conspire. In other words, there's joint secret plans to commit unlawful acts against God and against His church. Then there's the peoples who plot. They collide, they scheme with the idea to overthrow illegally anything that is of Christ. Then there's the kings of the earth that take their stand. They stand in sedition and insurrection against Christ and his ecclesia. And then lastly, there's the rulers that gather together, forming evil alliances against Christ. And listen to what they say in verse 2. These four groupings, the nations, the peoples, the kings, the rulers, say the following. Let us break their bonds. Let us break the bonds of the church and cast away their cords from us. They say, in other words, there's two categories. There's the us and the they. They say, let us cast away their encircling decrees. These words are indicative of combining the categories together in one joint effort. <clears throat> it is an all-inclusive conglomerate in corporate action and intent against the Lord and against His church. This is what is currently happening globally on the human stage, where the ideology and the philosophies of fallen religion and men that are set against the church, concocting evil plans to wipe out the church, persecute the saints in every region of the earth is underway. It is a global revolt against God and against his church. In every strata of men is involved. Every level of unregenerate man is organizing a revolt against God in thought, in opinion, in ideology, in philosophy, in attitude, and in action. So don't go look further away from where we currently finding ourselves in the earth. These things are unfolding in every land, every nation, set against Christ and against His church. The wars that you see, the things that you are seeing in the earth today, all has got one root. It is aimed against Christ and against His church. I want you to look beneath the external arrangement of things, and I want you to go into the root, the things that lays unseen, as unseen realities within the nations. So I want to unfold to you quickly what these four words mean. The nations. In the Hebrew language, it's called the Goyim, G-O-Y-I-M, the Goyim. The Goyim were considered to be non-Israelites or heathen peoples or pagan peoples that surrounded the nation of Israel. 
they were called Gentiles, which is a religious designation for these non-Israelite nations. The Goyim were cut off from Israel's spiritual covenants, and they did not share in the promises made unto Abram through Isaac. Ephesians 2 verses <clears throat> 1, uh, sorry, verses 12 and to 13 states, Therefore, remember that you, speaking about us, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hand, at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So notice the Goyim or the nations that are not, that are not Jewish or as non-Israelite are Gentiles in the flesh. That has, that has to do with race, ethnicity and nationality. They are called the uncircumcision. They are without Christ. They are aliens. This refers to being foreigners and unfamiliar to the commonwealth of Israel. And the commonwealth are considered to be God's heritage and the object of his promises. The original 12 tribes, the tribes of Israel, whom the Gentiles were cut off from, are considered to be the commonwealth of Israel, and they are called strangers from the covenants of promise. All the covenant promises culminated in Jesus, but they were once cut off from these promises, not having God in their lives. They were without hope and without God in the world. They are those who are considered to be far off from Christ. But all the unredeemed peoples of the earth are classified as the Goyim today. The Goyim can only be brought near by the blood of Christ and so be incorporated into Christ and his church kingdom. Then the Goyim were defined in three particular ways. They were defined politically, how they were governed and legally constituted. They were defined ethically, in other words, their belief system and how they were cultured, constituted. They were defined territorially. In other words, they assigned or geographical allotted places where they dwell. And we find this also stated as far back as Genesis and Jeremiah. In Genesis 10.5 it says, From these the coastland peoples of the Gentiles were separated into their lands, everyone according to his language according to their families, into their nations. And Jeremiah 9.26 names a few of these Gentile nations. Egypt, it says Judah, Edom, the people of Ammon, Moab, and all who are in the farthest corners who dwell in the wilderness. For all these nations are circumcised, sorry, are uncircumcised. These nations, the Goyim, were considered uncircumcised wicked, abominable, and idolatry. Now, they form part of this conglomerate that speaks against the Lord and His Holy One. They concoct plans against the church and the Son of God. And then secondly, we see another group of people called the peoples. And they in the Hebrew language is called the Leom, the Leom. L-E-O-M, Leom. These are ethnic groups that has internal cultural bonds with one another within the nations. They are a sub substructure within the nations, formations within the nations, and they are clustered together by ethnicity and cultural bonds. They are groupings within the nation. Their emphasis is on togetherness reflected in a group of people sharing in a common ethnicity and cultural identity, a cohesive identity who share common characteristics and relationships 
like the Indian peoples, for instance, or the colored peoples, or the black peoples, or the Chinese people. They are clustered together based on ethnicity, culture, and have bonds that reflect their common ethnicity and cultural identity. And then there's a third category of people, the kings. In the Hebrew language, they are called the Melech. The Melech. They reflect rulers within the groupings within nations. In other words, you have the Goyim that reflects the entire nation. Within the nations, you have the Leon, which are groupings of clustered ethnical groups within the nation. And within them, you find the Melech. They reflect rulers of, on different levels of authority within a nation or a group of people. They exercise dominion in a functional sense on behalf of their people. They are duly elected representatives, having vested in them the principle of rulership and governorship. And then lastly, we have the rulers. These are the most important grouping within the Leo or within the nations, within the Goyim. They are called the Razan in the Hebrew language, the Razan. I'm saying all of these things because I want to let you in to understand what is currently happening in the world and in the nations. And we as the church cannot get caught in the cycles of earthly reality. We got to look beyond the natural occurrences of the earth and determine the root causes of things within the nations. So the Razan means to be heavy, weighty, judicious, commanding, and honorable. They are the pinnacle of human prowess. They carry a certain amount of external glory about them intended to mesmerize and mislead. These are the ones who operate their dubious plans with a sense of regality and crooked stateliness. They are the learned, the educated strata within government, within politics and social groupings within society. They are the accomplished, successful intellectuals within the lands. They are the sly, political, astute fraternity who the Goyim holds in high esteem. These are the ones that holds high office. They are the presidents, those in the UN and the EU and the World Economic Forum, in whom are vested the interests of the people groups on whom the Goyim has pinned their hopes for a better future. Yet they are morally and ethically corrupt and at best can only produce wisdom that is earthly and void of eternity. They have negotiation, negotiation skills. They, they have got intellectual ability, reasoning minds, operating on logic, the orphan at, at best. You find them in religious organizations, in civic and human rights formations set against the authority of Christ. They are fighting the cause of humanity and seek to unite the Goyim the Leom and the Malek to become one united order in the world. The Razan operate in a cloud of mystery. They are like operating in the spirit of lawlessness. And the word lawless means simply that they work powerfully, but they work outside of the range of your apprehension and your comprehension. You will not know that they are working, but they are working seamlessly with popular news agencies, with popular presidents. They are working with popular governmental organizations, but they are set on one cause, and that is to go against Christ and his church and to bring the entire earth into that conclusive point where they stand against Christ and his anointed. Now, they are lawless, this Razan and anti-God, Behind their operations are masked principalities and powers. The prince of the power of the air, seeking to blind the minds of unbelievers 
lest they can see the glory of the gospel of Christ. They hate the established boundaries of divine law. They hate the church and seek to break down laws of morality and ethical standards. They seek to fuse all religions into one and unite unregenerate humanity into a so-called one world order. They operated in the day of King David and in the day of Jesus Christ, expressing themselves in the day of Christ in Pharisee and Sadducee positions. They operated in the early church in the book of Acts under the guise of Herod and Pilate who, con who colluded to undermine Christ and his newly established church as Acts 4 verses 1 to 31 states. And I want to read that to you because this is quoted in Acts 4 by the writer of the book of Acts. And he quotes out from Psalm 2. It says here in verse 1 of Acts 4, Now as they, the church, spoke to the people, the priests, the captains of the temple, and the Sadducees came up, or came upon them, being greatly disturbed, that they taught the people and preached in, in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers, there's that word Razan, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done, to a helpless man, the man that they helped at the temple uh, gate and, and, and brought them out, brought the man out of his, his agony of being lame and caused him to walk. And because of that, the rulers and the people and the elders of Israel were set against the apostles and the church. So rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well. Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter, verse 19, and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God <clears throat> to listen to you more than God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them. <clears throat> because of the people since all the since they all glorified God for what had been done and being let go they went to their own companions <clears throat> and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them so when they had heard that they raised their voice to God with one accord and said said Lord you are God who made heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them who by the mouth of your servant David have said, now they quoted Psalm 2, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. They brought history into their time and they quoted when they were under threat of the known rulers of their day, they quoted this back to God as a prayer. And we today must do likewise in our governmental decrees as we speak into the systems, the satanic systems of today. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pilate, Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles, there's the Gentiles, the Goyim, <clears throat> and the peoples of Israel, there's the Lohem, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal 
and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, <clears throat> the place where they assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. However, this is a current occurrence in which we see open revolt like in the days of Noah. Genesis 6, 5, 8 states, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, <clears throat> and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and bird of the air, for I'm sorry that I have made them, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah's external environment was organized against the authority of God. Yet Noah in himself upheld the truth of divine principle. If you wanted to know what God is about, you had to study Noah. In the day of calamity, in the day when every heart is set to do evil, Noah was the standard, the model that human life had to conform to. Yet, he was the embodiment of eternal truth in a world totally set against God. And so the church must become like Noah in this hour, the standard that will bring condemnation and judgment to an earth that is continually set against God in belligerent attitudes across the earth. Darkness in the day of Noah seemed to be dominant. And in the midst of all that, this is God's response in verse 6. The Lord was sorry that he had made man and put them on the earth. It broke the heart of God. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. The affirmation of Noah's standard did not come from this earthly realm, but from heaven. Nothing in the structure of satanic influence will validate you. The earth will deny you and seek to cause you to abort the purposes of God. Do not look for your validation from your job or your boss or your wife or your career or the realm of men. God alone is your affirmation and validation in a changing landscape in the earth that is set in belligerent attitude against the house of God. The father said of Jesus, his son, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. The affirmation of Jesus and the authority bestowed upon him were based on his moral integrity, his submission to the divine standards, his willingness to make himself of no reputation and his willing choice to live and walk in righteousness and justice. And so also, this is the pathway for the true church to dwell in an hour at the times of the end. This is how we ought to operate like the time. I want to bring your attention back to Psalm 2, verse 2. They say that these four groupings, <clears throat> they gather together. <clears throat> in other words, they form alliances to take counsel together against the Lord. They fortify their viewpoint through ideological perspectives. They develop into strong, resistant postures, having the same mind about an issue, to come together in consultation, to come together in consultation with the idea to formulate an opposing opinion against the church and against the Lord. They take their counsel together with the idea of outwitting all opposing forces. This is what it means that they gather together. And then in verse 2, they take their stand, Yatshab, to stand your ground, to confront belligerently, to stand in insurrection and sedition against the authority of God, as it is seen in the body of Christ. They stand as an adversary. To stand for their worldview and their opinion and their cause in the earth, even though it might be wrong, but they they progressively 
have been mandated to push their opinions against the authority of Christ in his church. And then again, they say there it is against the Lord and against his anointed. Against the Lord and against his anointed. They take their stance. The anointed of the Lord speaks of Christ in his church, the body of Christ. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Christ in the midst of the church. Physically, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father until everything is finished and completed. Everything you read in the Bible of what Christ is doing in the end time is done through the church. We are his representative body in the earth. His anointed body is the body of Christ. In fact, the words body of Christ means the corporate entity or vessel that is the carrier of the anointing or the ability of God in the earth. So Jesus is not getting up from his seat in the throne room until every enemy has been put beneath his feet. He will not break the law of the Sabbath. He is in Sabbath rest when he ascended and went to sit at the right hand of God. So what is he waiting for? He's waiting for a triumphant, belligerent church against the systems of humanity and evil set against it. We need to finish what he started on the cross. We need to complete the work that he started. All enemies must be placed under his feet. We will not leave in a rapture until there's a glorious church in the earth, a church without spot, a church without wrinkle, and any such thing. We cannot now want to fly away in a rapture and the work is far from being done and far from over. The church must contend for the faith positions of the forefathers and we need to come into their belief system against the authority that is set against it in this hour. So we cannot cry and run out of the demise of systems of reality. God will place the triumphant church in the midst of the crises that will unfold in Babylon. And it's there where we will make our final stance. It will be a glorious stance. Every nation will have to conform to the patterns of reality that comes from a belligerent church, a triumphant church. Because the Bible says in Micah chapter 4, Isaiah chapter 2, that in the last days the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains. And the nations will say, come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord's house. That is not yet, yet, not yet in the earth, but God is working feverishly to set the church up into that standard within the earth. So we cannot play games. We can't operate in the spirit of sentimentality. We can't go back to yesteryear. We got to, got to move progressively forward as an apostolic people. I am not here to play game and play, play church with you. I am only giving the word and the Lord said to me this morning, Sean, whoever comes on the platform, speak to them. Don't go look for people that are not willing to conform to what you are talking. So I'm not going to go look for people that are not here. If they not come ever again, that's fine. But even if there's five, even if there's one, I will speak what God is saying to the church in this hour. This is where we are on the cutting edge, where Heaven is illuminating the horizon of time. This is what God is currently wanting the church and the earth to know. As Psalm 110 verses 1 to 7 states, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. How long will he sit there? He will sit until all his enemies are made his footstool. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. You will rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing in the day of battle. Arrayed in holy majesty, from the womb of the dawn, you will receive the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge nations, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. He will drink from a brook beside the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. I'll unfold that whole psalm to you in the coming weeks. Psalm 110, 
We're going to look at that psalm together and what it means for us today. There's an order of priesthood that is in the earth relevant. And there are some people yearning back to natural Israel that the third temple must be built there and the, and the sacrificial system must be set up again in natural Israel, making them the holy people of God. No, that's wrong theology. We, the church, are the holy people of God, made up of both Jew and Gentile that has come by way of the cross into the new ethnos, the new man called Christ. Made up of both Jew and Gentile. That's the new nation, the holy nation of the living God. The new Jerusalem, the heavenly city, coming down from God, coming out of heaven. It's the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city that God has got his focus upon and not natural Israel. Natural Israel was there at the beginning. God chose them as a nation through whom, through whom the Messiah had to be born. And now the focus must be on the Messiah, on the Christ, and no longer on a natural entity called natural Israel in Jerusalem. The eschatology of the church is wrong. And that's why so many of God's people are being led astray today by wrong eschatological perspectives that has come through the dispensationalists. And so it must be rectified through an apostolic medium on an apostolic platform. And that's what I want to do to you and for you in this hour. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 28, then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father uh, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Where is he? He is in rest, in Sabbath, upon the throne. Who must do all this work? The church of the firstborn, the church of the living God. We can't run out of the earth. We got to take our stance. We got to have the posture and the position of our God. We got to laugh at the calamity of men. Form alliances, come into networks come into pastoral tables and apostolic tables and build the church of the living God and formulate the, 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 the gates that is being broken down and the wall to set up a new system of immunity across the earth. And that's what apostolicity is all about, brethren. It's not this faint-hearted group of people that every time want to run away out of the earth when things in the earth becomes difficult. No, we are the answer to the nations. We are the representative priesthood in the earth after the order of Melchizedek. So we're not running away from the responsibility that God has placed upon us as his church. The charge was given to the early apostles, go into all the world, preach the good news to all the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, teaching them to observe and obey what has been commanded unto you. That is still the structure of the reality of the spiritual and the eternal today. We will not stop proclaiming the gospel within every land. Every Muslim nation must hear the gospel of Christ because his love is set upon all nations, not just one, not just a singular nation. All the nations are in view. All the nations are in view. Why? Because Psalm 2 says, Ask of me and I give the nations. Plural for your inheritance, not just one nation. So we can't operate in a sense of nationalism where one nation is in view, Israel. No, all the nations are in view because the prophetic decree has been made to the Son. Ask of me and I will give you the nations, plural, as your inheritance. That includes Palestine that is set against Israel. That includes Israel. That includes Russia. It includes China. It includes the Muslim nations and every other nation that we consider as barbaric in the earth today. I want you to understand the prophetic decrees of God. So I want you to see for he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him, who put everything under him, that God may be all in all. We can't run away, brethren. This is a fight to the end. 
Some will lose their lives, but we are going to press ahead with pro proclaiming the gospel of Christ and the gospel of his kingdom in all the nations of the world. If you think it's about having a nice church service, you missed it. It's not a church service anymore. It's about this belligerence that is against the church rising up in every nation. And the church is, church is babying away, wanting to have nice services and feel goosebumps upon their faith. We can no longer do this, brethren. We've got to take this apostolic stance. We've got to understand what it's all about. Everything you read in all the prophets about what God is doing and going to do in the earth, how he's going to humble kings and how he's going to fight, that speaks about Christ in his church. The biggest mistake that we have ever made is that we disconnected ourselves from these things that God is doing. Therefore, since Jesus was not here, then it had to happen in some future period of time. So we condemned ourselves to inactivity, impotence, and waiting passively until all these things come into being in some undetermined time in the future when Jesus returns. People are saying when Jesus returns, he will deal with Satan. He's already dealt him a blow, brethren. We're waiting for him to come. No, he's waiting on us to do what he has asked us to do. Many of the prophetic words have to do with what we do in the earth. We are the body of Christ in the earth. The vessel in which his anointing, his ability, his power, his strength must be displayed. When we act, it is God acting in and through us. We are his representative body in the earth. So we are on the side of God. When we act, it's God acting on the human stage. Don't wait for him to come. He's in rest. He's waiting for us to complete the task in the earth, to put all his enemies under his feet. So the goat nations, according to Matthew 25, are raging. They come into satanic alliance and hear what the devil is saying prophetically in these last days. Verse 3, let us break their bonds. That there, there is the church and their chains, they say, and cast away their cords from us. In other words, throw off their fetters. There's only one proclamation in this hour coming from the domain of Satan. The devil feels that he's being bound. And satanic systems are being bound by apostolic decrees going forth in the earth. Not just governmental prayer, but by every accurate words spoken from the mouths of apostles and prophets. There is a encircling decree that goes around satanic systems and bind them that they cannot operate effectively as they could do in the days when there were no apostles and prophets in the earth. So I want you to understand the, the, the method of the warfare is not just a prayer warfare, but it's on all fronts as God has now raised up his cannons, the apostles and the prophets, that does not discount the pastors and the evangelists and the teachers. All of, the, all of them form one grouping within the hand of God. But the, the huge cannons that lay foundations, break open realms, are the apostles and the prophets. And they bring the, the, the unfolding of the divine intentions of God to the church. Like I'm doing here this morning. They're helping you to understand the mysteries behind the external realities. To see into the predetermined things of God, what God is after in the earth. They say, let us break their bond. That's the word coming out of satanic systems. The whole of the, of the satanic realm is in a state of flux. It is ever changing because the devil doesn't know what's going on because he's not omnip omnipotent, neither is he omniscient. He's surveying the church to see what is on the horizon of the eternal. He's looking at the church, but the church in many cases has become reactionary. Instead of being proactive, we are running from our responsibility, making decrees in the earth of how we are going to go in the sweet by and by and sit on clouds drinking milk and honey. This word break, natag, 
It means to draw away, to be torn, to be lulled away, to take shelter against, to drag off. So what is the devil saying? The devil is saying through his system and those who embodies these ideals within society, let us draw the church away. Let us lure them into traps and from their shelter in Christ. Let us cause them to take shelter in worldly system built through clever inventive initiatives that come from satanic systems. And they say, let us break their chains. The word chains there means the shackles and the bonds and the chastisements and the restraints. The devil is not going to make this statement unless he's being bound and he can't cast away the boundaries of our statutes of limitations. That's what the chains mean, the fetters mean of the church. The church is binding Satan, is binding his movements in the earth by our active decrees, by the way that we live, by the way that we interact and have covenant. So the devil is not going to make the statement unless he's being bound by a totally triumphant church in the earth. And he's, he can't cast away our boundaries and our statues of limitation. That's what it means. Or governmental decrees. So he says, let us cast off and throw off their encircling decrees to cast away or throw down or throw out forcibly and evict from us to hurl away. That's what the enemy is saying. He's saying, let us cast away the church's limiting statutes and the church's encircling decrees. Let us cast off the stuff that is bringing us and binding us and tying us down. That comes from the depth of Satan's core where he exists. It is now the one proclamation that comes from the satanic domain. We are being bound. There's a, there's a powerful apostolic church again in the earth and prophetic decrees are going forth to bind us. And we are feeling that we can't do what we used to do in the past. I want you to understand this. This is the warfare to which Abram's seed is pressing, pressing into the gates of the enemy. This is to be truly apostolic, not for the faint heart. The enemy is reactive. We are being proactive. He is being bound and we are being liberated through our active governmental decrees, our pure lifestyle, our accurate and righteous stance within the realms of flesh, the sold out church is binding the operations of Satan within nation state. So the devil is rising up in satanic alliances, taking counsel together, forming alliances because he's being bound. When you read this, you, read, you need to understand that the devil is facing a totally triumphant, victorious and dangerous church in the earth. We are not the victims of the earth. We are triumphant in the midst of crisis, in the midst of what's, what is going on in the nations. Where our eyes are not fixated upon what Satan wants us to see in the lands. Because if we put our and gaze upon what Satan is doing, he will demoralize us. Our focus is upon Christ, looking unto Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. That's where we fixate our focus we look at him we see him in victory and we uh, take that victorious stance in the earth and as he laughs we laugh in the earth at the calamity of the devil and what he's planning for the church because we know the outcome we know the outcome the enemy doesn't want the church to have as an inheritance the uttermost ends of the earth and the entirety of nation states so he is concocting plans to go against the church to limit our movements. They can only move here and there if they have issued a COVID, uh, what they call a passport. I will cause their movements to be inhibited in the earth. But I've got news for you, Mr. Devil. The enemy is in his final demise. 
Yes, our God made an open spectacle of him on the cross, but he is still going around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, and the church might out, outwit satanic system by the wisdom of the apostolic and the prophetic. Wisdom has built her house and has hewn out the seven pillars. You cannot build an apostolic house without wisdom. You can't build what I'm building here without wisdom. This wisdom doesn't come from Sean's brain. It comes from the revelation that Christ gives. But if you still are not believing that, then go your way, brother. Go your way, sister. Do your thing. Fall back in charismatic positions. Do what you want to. And I will speak to those who want to listen to my voice. Because we are in the final state. The nations are in uproar. And God is causing unregenerate nations now to surface in the earth. Is God causing these things? I will prove it to you from Scripture, but not. So God is setting things up in the earth. He's becoming belligerent against the church. But we can't run away. We need to understand the triumphant stance of our God and take that posture in the earth of laughing vision against devil is trying. Let me tell you something. We're not plotting God's purposes by watching what the devil does. The will of God is not subjected to what the devil says and what the devil does. The will of God has been eternally set in the councils of divinity before there was a devil. We are more ancient than the devil. We were in the thoughts of God before time began. He called you. To be holy and blameless in his sight. That's what we taught you in the book of Ephesians. So the devil is not more senior to us. And the devil is not God's opposition either. God has got no op op opposing forces standing against him. That's why the enemy is fighting the church. But the church needs to understand how to apostolically rearrange themselves in clusters and groups. But the more we try to bring the body of Christ together, the more people move away. They don't even want to come on this platform. They don't even want to come when we call them for prayer. Doing their own stuff. But there is a remnant being formed by God in the nations of the earth. Will you be part of that remnant? God can't wait anymore for everybody. So we are forcing this devil to abandon his separate, diverse policy into pooling all his forces and manifest it into one strategy called Antichrist. We want Antichrist to manifest on the earth because if there's no Antichrist, there's no end to the purposes of God. And we are the ones that must expedite the purposes of God in the earth. How can we run away? Because we don't understand the strategy of apostolic and prophetic warfare. This is governmental activity. This is what God is mobilizing the devil towards. A one option policy. Antichrist. The church is mobilizing the enemy towards putting all his eggs in one basket. Antichrist. And when he does that, God will break him through the church. We need to study the Bible not from a victim's position, but from an architect's position. The architect tones of the earth are the apostles and prophets. The apostles are the wise master builders. The word is architecton and means the designer of the things of God. The church is taking the triumphant position in the earth. Doctrine shapes your mentality. If your theology is passive and escapist, you will raise up a weak generation of people that do not believe that they have the power in Christ to enforce change. That's why now we talk detente. You know the word detente? It's a French word that means to talk compromise with the enemy. We are in detente, wanting to slip away and wanting to run away. And entertaining one another in church buildings and feel God and the goosebumps of God and having our Greek and Hebrew that we study in our churches while the world is going to a Christless eternity. It's 
time to break out, brethren. It's time to be seen and heard in the streets. It's time to take the word of God to the gates of the enemy. It's time to make a proclamation of the divine intention of God by making the decrees of God in the face of those that are unsaved. That's what the church is supposed to do right now, to take the gospel of the kingdom and no longer just having church as usual. If you have an apostolic theology and an apostolic doctrine, you will raise up a generation of people that know how to cooperate with prophetic frequency to birth the purposes of God in the earth. That is the mentality of the 21st century. It is the new accurate mentality of the church. The devils are saying, we are being bound. The prophetic and apostolic church must bring the enemy to that confession. We are being bound by a totally triumphant church in the earth. So I'm calling you back to your responsibility this morning. I'm calling you back to prayer. I'm calling you back to integrate. I'm calling you back to build with me the house of God. Don't be out on your own. Don't do your own thing. Come together. Migrate toward grace. I'm not leading you astray. I'm leading you in the paths of God's righteousness. Watch my words in the days in which we are going. Apostles are going to talk about Psalm 2. Because in the coming days I will unfold the Psalm. The triumphant stance is, ask of me. We got to enter into that prophetic asking of the Son of God. Ask of me and I will give the nations for your inheritance and the uttermost earth, earth as your possession. The nations is ours, brethren, for the taking. And the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The highest heaven belongs to the Lord, Psalm 115 says, but the earth is given unto the sons of men. These are, this is our earth. We've been given the right to take dominion in this earth. We cannot abdicate the responsibility any longer. We've got to become apostolic in here and prophetic in our sight, setting our gaze upon the horizon where God is pressing toward the gates of hell. Enemy is feeling bound by a triumphant church that is now rising up in the sectors of it's not a big church either because not everybody wants to build the house of God. Some wants to remain in Babylonian captivity, but gets assimilated into the systems of men's reality. And I'm breaking out. I want to break you up into this. Come on. This is it. There's no other way out for the true apostolic church. I'm part of such a church. Such a church. If you want to play games, go on playing. If you want to feel God, then go on feeling God. I don't want to feel God. I want God back in the earth. That's the internal desire in the groan in my heart. I mean, groaning. We want Him back. We want Him back, not His presence. We want Him back. That's what the apostolic church is all about. Not a church that is just happy, compliant with presence. We want the person in the present. Want him back, brethren. But we will not see him back until we say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Oh, I long to gather you as a hen would gather her cheeks, but you would not let me. Your house shall be left unto you desolate until you can say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's not him physically returning. That sent one's coming in his name. And if you reject the one sent to you, you reject him. Tantamount to rejecting him. So don't reject what you don't understand. Migrate toward grace that God has given you. I'm just a man, just like you. But I know the grace God has given for you. Not so we're done for today. And we will continue with this message.